Welcome to Kentucky. The birthplace of Abraham Lincoln and built on the largest cave system in the known world. The home of Daniel Boone, Hunter S. Thompson, horse racing, and bourbon. And when the hour grows late, the bluegrass state becomes the breeding ground for realms beyond those familiar to the human race. In the east, ghosts, spirits, and ethereal entities roam the hills and hollers. In the north, Mothman beats his wings along the banks of the Ohio River. To the west, small green creatures stalk farmhouses and disappear without a trace when shot. While in the south, the energy of the Belle Witch is palpable just over the border. Joining with us as we investigate just what goes on in the bluegrass and And ask the question, how many coincidences are too many? There's no need to check the clock. There's no need to, There's no need to check the clock. Time is an illusion. Time is-, Time is an illusion. And it's midnight. It's midnight. In Kentucky. In Kentucky. In Kentucky. In Kentucky. In Kentucky. In Kentucky. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. It's the Midnight Hour, and you are listening to Midnight in Kentucky. I'm Ben. I'm Stephen. Before we get into our uh, main story this week, let me quickly say if you guys would help us out and check us out on Facebook and Twitter... And we have anything else? We have YouTube now. And a YouTube. Uh-huh. We've got a, dude, I almost completely forgot about that. <laughs> we have a YouTube now. Be sure to check that out. We've only got one episode up. Uh, I think we're probably going to start from that one and go forward from there. But the video we do have up is last, two weeks ago's episode, which is on the Kentucky Cryptids, which we touch a little bit on what we're going to be talking about tonight. So be sure to check that out. It's a whole new way to experience the show. We've got some cool stuff in there. But uh, before we start that out, we're going to get back to a case that has been developing um, over the past few months um, that it doesn't really seem like a lot of people are putting together. I mean, it seems like it's happening, but nobody's bringing it together. You know? Yeah, I mean? there's no, nobody, like, I guess, taking the data and saying, hey, look, it's happening here and here. And again. And, and you would think the news organizations that's covering this, local news, right. would say, hey, what's behind all of these? But right. then you get the quote from the 911 so maybe someone is putting it together and right and of course what we're talking about here are the uh, mystery booms that have been occurring in Kentucky since late December mid December yeah i can't remember the date of it's the first it's almost consistent one. now almost every week it it really is there has been since the th- this is the third though overall right there yeah. was one one week one i think it was about the first week in or the second or third week in December, about the mid middle of December. Then there was another one. Now there's this one. Um, this happened on Wednesday, January 23rd, or um, I guess it would have been the night before, because that's actually when the story came out. Uh, we did fo- we did post this story on our Facebook. Uh, the name of the story is Mystery Boom Heard in Three Kentucky Counties, and it comes from WKYT. Um, essentially it it says that, um, the evening before on, on Tuesday evening, uh, several people in Jackson County and Madison County, as well as Rockcastle County, Jackson, Madison, and Rockcastle, is that right? Yeah. Yeah. Jackson, Madison, and Rockcastle County had heard this, uh, this mystery boom. And, um, that could have, probably should have been the end of it. But then, uh, the Jackson County 911 chimed in (laughs) on Twitter And, uh, says, and I'm just gonna read this for you folks, cause it's too good not to read in full. Um, Jackson County 911 says on Twitter, Facebook. It was on Twitter. It was on Twitter, okay. Well, that makes it even more official. It's on Twitter. Um, says this on Twitter. Jackson County 911 says this. We know about the boom, and we have no clue where it came from. All we know is that it was felt and or heard in at least three counties. Here's where it gets interesting. No, it's not a, Quotation marks conspiracy in quotation marks. And no, we are not hiding anything. We only know what is reported to us. We have people out looking, and without a definite area to look, it will it will be like finding a needle in a haystack. So, what do you think about these booms, man? What do you think about this one especially? And with nine one one saying that it's not a conspiracy and they're not hiding anything. To me, there's a couple of things reason why they put that out. That has to be put up by I guess an official word. So. Obviously, people are starting to call and and ask a lot of questions. Sure, sure. And to me, the the tweet, or maybe it was a Facebook post, but one of the, whatever the social media post, right, right, was kind of like a out of frustration. Right, right, right. And you know, and you know, you take Jackson County and and Madison County and Rockcastle County, 
I mean, Madison and Rockcastle County is pretty close together. Right. But Jackson is, like, further over. See, that's what I was thinking. Yeah. I was thinking Jackson was a decent way. And, but still, you know, all these places are hearing these. And, you know, and if you think about it, they started in the western part of the state and they worked eastward. Right. You know, and that seems to be the history of these, you know, of what I've read up on past news articles and stuff of, since, like, 2008 when these have been going on. Of the booms, right? Of the booms. They kind of seem to work in a direction, like, you know, one part in the west would get it, and then a few weeks or months later, further east would get it, and it right. keeps going. And they're all the same. No one can explain them. But there has to be some type of seismic activity right. that's going off. That's what I've heard from a lot of people. I've heard a lot of people say that they think maybe it's the earthquakes. Um, there was actually one that happened this week in Chicago that uh, somebody had had uh, mentioned on Facebook, and it was explained as um, I don't I can't remember the exact name for them, but it's when the ice in the soil starts to break apart yeah. and causes these booms. I've heard that too, um, and that make some sense, but some of these have been in times where there hasn't been a lot of... Right. It's, it's warm weather. And, you know, a big, a big um, reason for them, or supposed reason for them that we get around here, are uh, people shooting Tanner out, or yeah. blowing up Tanner And out. that's such a tired excuse. The, to me, there's no way it could be. I mean, no. three counties, man, you'd have to have... I mean, we're talking, you know, I, you gotta think. The first nuclear bomb was heard for 50 miles. Like yeah. the very, so we're talking like an early nuclear bomb type. You know what I mean? Right. So, no, Tannerite is definitely not the same as a nuclear bomb blast. Yeah. And then I've heard people saying, oh, well, they blew up a cattle trailer. Well, if some country folks blow up a cattle tra- trailer, you ain't going to hear it halfway across the state. Exactly. Like, you're not going to hear it for three counties. That makes yeah, no you sense. You might hear it maybe a five mile radius. Maybe. Right. Exactly. Like, yeah. you're definitely not going to hear it for three counties, though. And they're going to rattle. Houses and, and right, windows right, and right. stuff. This is clearly something underground type going on. So you say underground. Of course, last week we talked about the Mammoth Cave System. This week we're going to be getting a lot into yeah. the Mammoth Cave System. Do you think it has something to do with our cave system? I systems? think maybe what we're going to discuss a little bit tonight, um, I'll give a theory of maybe what's going on. Awesome. I'm yeah, excited yeah, for that. So, All right, cool, yeah. cool, cool. Um, it is interesting it seems like these booms have increased in hap- happenstance. It seems like they're increasing. It seems like it's occurring more. Yeah, more. the frequency of these are getting more and more. And, and I'm kind of wondering if maybe they've happened all along, and right. maybe social media is helping us see that the people's reporting on them. Sure, sure. And then the news organizations are picking them up and, right. and getting quotes and stuff from people. But for the 911 just to go out on our own and put that out there it's means odd. they got a lot of reports right. and a lot of people questioning right. you know what's going sure. on. Sure. So so you think that maybe these people were calling in and saying, you know, you guys know something about yeah. it, you tell us. Yeah. Okay. The yeah. government's keeping secrets, you know, type thing. Which you, they you, probably are, but I don't know sure. if like the Jackson County <laughs> The Jackson County Sheriff's Department's keeping the government right, right. I got a gray locked yeah. up back in the You know, they're not the fish and wildlife department. <laughs> <laughs> now they are keeping the government. Right, because right, we're happening in Monroe County. No, no, I, I fully. But you know, I was talking about that with somebody earlier. This is a little sidebar. I was talking about that with somebody earlier this week too, and and I told them, you know, because they they were kind of quite they were a listener of the show. We were talking about it, and uh, he said, you know, so you really think that the Fish and Wildlife Department's keeping this hidden from us? I'm like, no, man, I don't think the Fish and Wildlife Department's keeping nothing from you. I think somebody's coming to the Fish and Wildlife Department saying we're going to cut your budget. Heavily, if you start talking about dogmen or, you know, anything <laughs> right. like that. And that's how that stuff works. Right, exactly. Yeah. And and I think, you know, the, he also asked about the sheriff. He said, well, why were they why were they down in the sheriff in Monroe County, you know, telling them not to talk about the cougar if it's really this dogman or whatever you guys think it is? And I said, well, I think it's because they knew that the sheriff was going off on a something that they didn't want him to talk about, and no. they and they figured that if he started digging into this cougar, that it might lead him to something else, something bigger. Yeah. So, and, and you know, when we'll get into discussions about these type of things oh, on yeah, the show, yeah, yeah, and and it's possibly you know there is a group of people that you know that I have no idea who they would be, sure, no theories sure. on who the group of people is, but maybe they do control have some budgetary control and 
Or something worse than budgetary control. Yeah. Hell, maybe they come in there and start threatening people. Yeah, good possibility. <laughs> you know, you know I, mean, I mean, maybe they... Uh, nah, I'm not going to go to the point of, you know, stuff that happened in plus 10 years ago, but maybe... Ah, maybe. well, I mean, I'm sure I'm sure local listeners can infer. And yeah, oddly yeah. enough, I've been talking about that case recently. So. Interesting. Interesting. Yeah, yeah, maybe they just go in there and drop a name say, oh, yeah, do you remember when that happened? And, sure. And take it sure. at face value, you know? For sure. And, you know, in in relation to these booms, we may never figure out what they are. I mean, yeah. we, we may never fully understand what they are, kind of like what we're getting into this evening, which we'll, we'll be getting into here in just a bit. But um, it's interesting that they're increasing in frequency. It's interesting that, you know, they have increased in frequency in the past few months. Yeah. So, um, but uh, if anything else happens, of course, we'll be reporting on it here. So stay tuned for more on these mystery booms. Maybe eventually we'll have a full episode on this. Um, Till then, you know, we'll we'll be reporting on it here at the first as they happen. Um, but tonight, tonight we are talking about a docu series recently released on YouTube and Hulu. Not on Hulu. I don't think it's on Hulu. Prime, Netflix. Um, from the team behind Weekend Weird, and they also do uh, Planet Weird. Yeah. Planet Weird is their other one. Um, two really good researchers that I like a lot, respect a lot, read a lot of their work. It's uh, Greg and Dana Newkirk, and of course, uh, the documentary we're talking about is Hellier. Um, Stephen and I have a special interest in this one, seeing as how it's literally based in eastern Kentucky, right down the road from us has a lot of uh, tie-ins with Kentucky folklore and Kentucky happenings. So uh, yeah. we're going to talk about it. We're going to talk about the goblins, which are the center piece of the docuseries. Uh, we're going to get into some uh, investigations that Stephen has done on his own, which I could say I took part in it, but it's all Stephen. He's got some pretty cool shit. So Greg, Dana, Connor, Carl, Rashad. Yeah, I seen you, Rashad. If any of you guys are listening, I think we may have a break in the case. Um, if not, if anybody else is listening, check out the docu series before you start listening to this, because we are certainly going to spoil it for you. Certainly going to spoil a large aspect of the series for you. Definitely watch it. We'll include the note. We'll include the series from YouTube in the show notes. So check that out before you start this. But uh, that's what we're getting into tonight. So we'll be right back in just a second. Thanks for tuning in. And the anger you like.
All right, welcome back to Midnight in Kentucky. Thank you guys so much for tuning in. Like I said just a few minutes ago, we're going to be talking about the Hellier docu-series and the ongoing um, Kentucky Goblins legends, mythos, um, happenings, phenomena, whatever you want to call them. Uh, we're going to get into the cave system a little bit. But to start this out, let me give you guys a little back history on this story in 2012, I believe it was. Yeah. So in, in June of 2012, um, Greg Newkirk was contacted by a man by the name of David Christie, or so we, so we were led to believe his name was David Christie, about um, these creatures who were on his land in eastern Kentucky in a, in a town called Hellier, which of course, when the story was originally released, the name of the town wasn't released with it. Um, but we knew it was somewhere in eastern Kentucky. I've been following this story for quite a while just based on where it's at, what what all it connects to. But uh, in June of 2012, David Christie gets in, talk, gets in contact with Greg Newkirk through a defunct email. It was an email that he had from an old investigation team that he no longer used. Um, he himself says it's not the most professional as when they were kids. So David Christie gets in contact with him and um, asks him if he would be interested in finding out about these um, creatures that are on his property. He says his kid's seeing them, his kid's talking about them, um, his kid sees them playing in the yard at midnight, which is actually where the first episode of Hellier gets its name from, the Midnight Children. But uh, So Greg gets this email, he emails the guys back, he's like, you know, and at the time, Greg or Dana weren't really into UFOs or aliens, and he tells the guys, like, we do more ghosts, be really interested, but, you know, can you give us some proof? So the guy emails him back again, uh, a few months later, I think, and sends him these, these uh, sends him a, a very detailed letter about everything that's happened, and... um at this point, it spurs Greg's interest a little more, and he asks the guy, he says, we'd love to come to Kentucky, but we just need a little more evidence. So this David Christie fellow emails him back with photos of uh, footprints and photos of a goblin creature hiding behind a tree. Um, not, not the greatest photos in the world, but pretty yeah. convincing photos nonetheless. Um, so Greg decides to head to Kentucky, and, you know, at this point, he's still living in Canada, he, he has a hard time getting out of Canada in immigrancy, uh, he couldn't get out of Canada, but he was very interested in getting to Kentucky to investigate this case, so he mails David Christie back, and tries to arrange to go to Kentucky, and David Christie disappears completely, um, doesn't email him back, uh, do, do his emails bounce back, did he say his email? He said the email count no longer exists. Yeah. Which, to me, that's a little odd. Right, because it's hard to deactivate a... Like, a, I think he said somewhere towards the end it was like a Yahoo account. Yeah. Are they talking about Yahoo servers when they was trying to track things back? Track, yeah. I mean, it can be done, for, but most usually someone wouldn't go to the trouble place wouldn't check it anymore. Right, right, right. Um, now, if it that was, is odd. I hadn't yeah, thought about now, that. Now, if it was like a... You know, like let's say a work account or something. Yeah, right. that. But it, they wouldn't. You know, they want to track that back. You know, they'd been easy to identify this right. person. So if it was a Yahoo account, that's kind of interesting that it bounced back. I mean, who goes to the trouble of deleting a Yahoo account? Right. That's odd. I hadn't thought yeah. about that. Um, but in these emails, also, um, David Christie says he was put in contact with with Greg Newkirk through a mutual friend of theirs by the name of Terry Rist. Yeah. Which I hadn't put this together in the initial article, but Terry Rist is a, um, uh, it's terrorist. Yeah, play on words, yeah. Yeah, it's, yeah it's, a, it's a play on words for terrorist. And I didn't put that together when I originally read it, but when I was watching Hellier and Greg said it, I was like, oh, yeah, I guess it is. Yeah, I didn't put it together until he said it. I was like, oh, you know, that does, yeah. yeah. Um, but... Um, supposedly David Christie was put in contact with Greg Newkirk to come investigate these creatures on his property by this guy named Terry Rist. Now, Greg does some research. The only way that Greg can track back Terry Rist is from a book by Alan Greenfield called The Complete Secret Cipher of the UFO Knots. And also, um, another book called, um, Secret Rituals of 
the Men in Black. Secret Rituals of the Men in Black, yeah. So uh, these books are by Alan Greenfield, and apparently in this in these books, Terry Riss talks about being a um, a Vietnam veteran who was enlisted after Vietnam to clean out alien cave bases in the United States, right? Yeah. He was um, sent to eradicate these creatures in these cave bases. So Terry Rist was supposedly who puts Greg Newkirk in contact with, or I'm sorry, who puts David Christie in contact with Greg Newkirk. Of course, Greg doesn't know who this Terry Rist fellow is, looks him up, finds him, and the only place he can find mention of him is in The Complete Cipher of the Euphonauts and Secret Rituals of the Men in Black. Um, so there are tie-ins to this case with a case that we mentioned last week, uh, one of the most, probably the most popular or famous cases in Kentucky of UFOs and aliens, which is the 1955 Kelly Hopkinsville account. Um, I'm sure you guys, if you're listening to this, you surely know something about it. If not, give last week's episode a listen. Not going to spend a lot of time on that, but I will say this. In that case, the, the creatures described have become what's known as the Kentucky Goblins. Um, those, the descriptions of those creatures went on to inspire Gremlins and E.T. and, um, Pokemon. The, um, they, they went on to be the inspiration for the term Little Green Men. So that image of those goblins has become a very popular pop culture icon and has been seen as, as Stephen and I found out through doing research last week throughout Kentucky. They are very prominent Kentucky cryptid. Um, but these these beings that David Christie described running around his yard and, and attacking his house and that his kids are going to see are very reminiscent of the Kentucky Goblin scene in Hopkinsville. So um, at some point, Greg and Dana are doing an investigation into the Brown Mountains, which are in North Carolina, yeah. right? So they're doing this investigation in the Brown Mountains with, a, with another researcher by the name of Micah Hanks, who writes a lot for Mysterious Universe. He's a good researcher. But uh, Micah tells them he found this um, this alien cave base that this psychic told him would be there. And Greg, of course, says, well, yeah, we'll definitely check out an alien cave base. So they go down there, and, and they find this big... And, and the image I see every time I think about this thing, and they show it in the documentary, yeah. is the the image of the stone rolled in front of Christ's tomb. Yeah, that's kind like, of what I picture. And that's yeah. exactly what it looks like. It looks yeah. like this big stone that's been rolled in front of and this... And it just got put there. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so, of course, they didn't go in, or they couldn't get past this stone, but, uh, you know, it's kind of like Dana says in, in Hellier. She's like, if there ever was an alien cave base, this is where it would be at. Yeah. And um, so they get home, and Greg gets an email from Terry Rist. And he says, you were so close. You know, you were, why didn't you keep on? And it's, it's phrased very weirdly. It's phrased in broken little things, which, which uh, has precedence, which we'll get to in just a second. <clears throat> but, um, he also sends him these coordinates and these coordinates lead straight to Brown Mountain. Um, so we have, now we have Brown Mountain, which is, you know, famous for the Brown Mountain lots, these orbs or, or UFOs or whatever that, that are seen all the time around these mountains coming into involvement with Hellier and with Kelly and with the Kentucky Goblins. A lot of Hellier revolves around synchronicities. Um, and a lot of these synchronicities begin with Carl. Uh, a lot of these synchronicities revolve around Carl um, and what leads him into the case. What were your initial thoughts on on all of that, on all of these synchronicities that lead Carl into this. This is... Because I know you said that you had experienced some of these yourself. Yeah. The one that struck me as odd was when he was talking to him about it in the random Twitter bot they had. Yeah, yeah. Out of 1,400, you know, lines in their, that he could tweet, tweeted that random story. Right. The, the right return of the Kentucky Goblins. At the exact time... That they was talking about it, which I thought was very weird. Oh, yeah. And I've had similar things because I have I run a few Twitter bots, and one of them has like twelve hundred different quotes you can throw out. Right. And there's been times where like I will see something, you know, maybe on the TV or hear something on radio, or even be thinking about something, 
are talking to somebody about something, and the person from that quote or something related, that Twitter bot will do it at the exact same time. Right. Yeah. Which is a very odd synchronicity. And designing the bot myself, I know how it functions. Sure. And the odds of that doing it at, because for one, it's not only pulling out of random 1200 quote, quotes, it is doing at a random time frame that's not consistent. It's scrambling number doing it at a random time within two set time frames. Right. And the odd possibilities of that happen, and it's happened way more than one time. Oh, it's yeah. It's happened yeah. multiple times. Yeah. Well, I mean, you see people talking about that a yeah. lot. I mean, it, it seems like everybody's starting to realize now yeah. that something is picking up on yeah. something. And, you know, not to go off our subject here, no. but this is similar to how Facebook predicts Very what you're saying. So. Very much so. To me, there's something much more at play. And possibly Google, Facebook, and these Amazon even, has tied into something that we're unaware of of how the technology works. Sure. Because, you know, not even, I mean, people, computer scientists and stuff, we understand how things work. We can't exactly explain how these ones and zeros turn something on and sure, off. Sure, sure, sure. Control things. With well, a who, was it, chip. who was it? Who uh, was it? I can't remember to save my life now, but there's a famous science fiction writer that once said, um, the most advanced technology will be indistinguishable from magic. Yeah, who did say that? I can't remember who said it. But, yeah. but I mean, is that not the same yeah. thing? I mean, for all we know, you know, yeah. this technology that we're fucking around with may not be... Exactly. It could be something yeah. far beyond their... Yeah. In the medieval days, it had been called sorcery. Yeah, oh yeah. If if someone from the medieval days came here, this would be magic to them. Yeah. Everything in this room right now would yeah. be magic to them, essentially. Witchcraft type yeah. stuff. Sure. Yeah. Uh, so, to me, the synchronicities are maybe drove by something else sure. that we're not aware of, of somehow either the simulation we live in is doing that or the, you know, what we're getting ready to discuss with the, you know, these creatures possibly controlling these synchronicities because synchronicities always lurk around these type of events. Oh, very much so. And, and that actually brings a nice segue to our next, to the next thing I want to talk about. And uh, what we were talking about there was um, when Greg Pfeiffer discovered this case, he, he was listening to um, a radio interview or a pod. Uh, Dana and Greg were on another podcast talking about it, and he became very interested. And as soon as he texted out, you know, to Greg that he was interested in this, immediately on Twitter comes across the Kentucky Goblin um, article from Week and Weird, um, thinking it was something that Greg did, taking advantage of it. Um, Carl says, I see what you did there. And Greg says, I didn't do that. Um, so, um, just, just those strange little coincidences like that seem to pop up in all manner of cases across the paranormal spectrum, UFOs, ghosts, Bigfoot, Mm -hmm. these synchronicities keep happening. And, um, I'm currently, I'm writing a, a episode by episode review. Hopefully by the time you guys hear this, all of those will be out. But I'd like to quote something that's not my quote, but I did quote it in the episode one review, which is out now. Um, this actually comes from the Mothman Prophecies, the 2002 movie about John Kill's investigation, which they fictionalize it a little bit. But uh, John Klein, who is an Amla Glenn for John Kill in that movie, says this. He says, one day you're just driving along in your car and the universe points at you and says, ah, there you are. I've been looking for you. I've been looking for you. And it's almost like with these synchronicities that one day the universe is just like, you're the next step. Yeah. But as we learn, and and I'm, I'm going to stop sugarcoating now. If you haven't watched Hellier, stop listening. Watch the movie because I'm about to spoil it from, for you. Hmm. As we learn at the end, at up to this point, they haven't really discovered Anything. No. Strange things have happened, yeah. yes. But they've not got a goblin by the throat and thrown out a camera. No, and <clears throat> they didn't really make it any further than they did at the beginning when the emails first come in. Sure, sure. But at the same time, some definite strange things have happened. Yeah. All and, kinds of strange things. Right. Yeah. And, you know, it's it's obvious that something is happening in Hellier. It's obviously that something was happening to the... To what Greg and Dana and Carl and 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 the gang have been re- referring to themselves as the Alien Cave Base Task Force. Yeah. So obviously something weird was happening to the task force, right. but that never culminated in anything. 
I don't want to say substantial because there was substantial culmination, but it never culminated in them finding a creature or, you know, so it does make you question why all the synchronicities, why, you know, why were they led there? Why, yeah. why now? Why this? Why? It's almost like sometimes the synchronicities want to lead you to something. Right. And then, but they won't never give you the answer. It's almost like, you know, someone helping you with a math problem. They want to lead you, but they don't give you the answer. Right. Sure, sure. And, and you know, that brings up something that uh, Greg says in, in The Midnight Children, the first episode of the series. He says, and this is a paraphrase, but um, he, he basically says, you know, a lot of these cases, the longer you study them, the stranger they get. Mm-hmm. And Hellier is a prime example of that. Yeah. Um, the Mothman was a prime example of that, which um, there's a lot of tie-ins of the Mothman in the Hellier case. But it, it does seem like the like the more in-depth they get, the more strange things are thrown at them. The yeah. more outlandish shit is, is brought up, you know? So. Yeah. It, and as they, you know, go into it, you know, in the kind of work their way through the mountains of eastern Kentucky in different spots and talk to people. Right. It, it it almost seems like it you know, you get to a point where it's going up right. and then all of a sudden it's just it just drops off and, and just like, you know, even the part where they first went there. Yeah, yeah. Let's people, talk about that. They very very excited to talk to them. Yeah, very excited. People sharing stories. Right. The second time they come back, it's like no one knows. Nobody what wants to talk to yeah. them. Yeah. And Dana even mentions that. She says the strange thing the second time we come back was that nobody wanted to talk to us yeah. about the strange things. The strangeness was the lack of strangeness. Yeah. Um, that being said, though, um, what did you think about, and and uh, I'll get the news clip of this because I actually watched the original news clip of this. What did you think about the UFO that hung in the sky for four hours that the am- amateur astronomer had video of and that he had watched through his telescope and yeah. that all of these people reported? The the one guy said, "Hell, my whole family watched it." <laughs> yeah, I know. And, and that's the thing is, all these people in the Bible saying, and, "And I knew about this, and you've known about this huh? before this documentary." Right. That's kind of something common, you know. Right. And I've read about it on the internet, and a lot of people don't talk about them seeing it. And the news, you know, had on that. That was something. That wasn't no satellite. Right. right. You know, it was something there, and it, it hung over the town for hours. Right. Right. And. You know, furthermore, um, talking about the news and and to hook in with what you said earlier about the mystery booms, how the news seems to drop one story, yeah. but they don't want to connect it. When uh, when you know when they went back the second time, when Greg and Dana and Carl and Connor all went back, um, they they started calling the news stations and the newspapers, mm-hmm. and they didn't want anything to do with it. And you know, as a paranormal researcher, I have found you know. You bring up stuff like this, and and at first people are uncomfortable, and they chuckle a little bit, and they may not want to, you know, they they may be fragile at first about yeah. the whole thing. But the further you get with people, like the further, and he, they'll even do it to themselves. They'll even keep talking to themselves into taking it seriously. You know what yeah. I mean? And then they'll start telling you their stories, or then they'll start telling you stories about what's happened to them, you know, or about what's happened to somebody that they knew. People are are interested in this. Yeah. The news stations are are generally interested in things like right. this. So why did why did these local news stations news stations that you and I listen to on right. a daily basis yeah, out of Lexington? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, Why were they not interested in this? This seems like a prime story that they would cover to me. I mean, at least in those little segments, you know, those little uh, whatever. Yeah. The, you know, so why were they not? Why did they blow them off like they did? I thought that was very odd, but another thing I thought was odd is where they was trying to go to the courthouses and and things there, and and that's what in a way kind of struck me as odd because they said they went to courthouses. Right. This is in Pike County, and to my knowledge, there's only one courthouse. There's only one house. Yeah, yeah. Um. So I mean, maybe they was talking about municipal buildings because there is a few towns there in Pikeville, you know. I right. think or Pike County, you got Elkhorn City. You know, you got Pikeville. And Pikeville is a decently large 
city. It's got to be University of Arizona. I'd say it's about the size of Camelsville for people that live in our area. It's yeah. probably similar size of that. So, I mean, but it's not a small town. It's not a small town, no. I mean, of course, Hellier is. Hellier is a small town. Hellier is, I would say, and call Hellier a town. I think it's more of a community, like right. Windsor, right. Um, Salem. Yeah. You know, they have a gas station, and that's it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, community gas station yeah. where everybody meets. It's yeah. probably their post office, too. Right. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. You know, but, you know, the other um, officials wanted to talk to him, not even the cops or anything. Right. right, right. Um, to me, I thought that was odd. And it was such a big change from when Greg and Dana had went by themselves, and there were people telling them about Bigfoot that they had seen up there, which there is a lot of Bigfoot in that yeah. area. Eastern Kentucky has a lot of Bigfoot sightings. People were telling them about, you know, tracks like these that they had found on their property. And like you said, when they went back, not only did these people not want to talk to them, but the news didn't want to talk to them. Yeah. It, it, it was weird. It was almost like some type of veil got pulled over the yeah. town to be afraid of these, you know, outside people. Which, you know, you go over to Eastern Kentucky, you know, they probably don't. I mean, I guess that's a stereotype. They don't take the outsiders. Sure. sure. Um, the documentary kind of showed that. The second time they went. The first time they was kind of, you know, talking to them. I don't think there was, like, a, someone saying, don't talk to these people. And maybe the police and stuff was just like, you know, we're not getting on camera. And we're not wanting to get involved in this. Sure, sure. But the news organizations don't want to talk to them. That's odd. Because most usually they would at least entertain the idea. Oh, yeah. I mean, it's at least a story. It's time right. to take up on the news. Yeah. You know what I mean? I found that really odd, too, and not only that, but um, <clears throat> I found it, I don't, not so much odd, but uh, it was rather enduring that, you know, some of these people were very quick to help them out, like the guy who had found the, the corn stalks yeah. on, the, on the cave and stuff like that. Like, he was he was all about helping them and yeah. finding out, and yeah, yeah. And, you know, I think I like a... Of course, at one point, they was talking about staying in Pikeville, and it showed them staying at that one hotel and stuff. Yeah. And, you know, one thing I kind of thought, you know, because I've been in Pikeville a lot of times, me and I went over oh, there, yeah, yeah. and, you know, we've stayed over in Pikeville several times. There's other hotels in Pikeville, you know, right. that's nicer. Well, they stayed in the cabin. In, yeah, uh, and they went to Jenkins, which Jenkins, is Jenkins, which is a Jenkins. little bit outside of Pike County. It's like in the county... Below, I think it's like um, down below them a little bit, a little bit okay. south. Hmm. Um, which is not that far. It's about probably, you know, like from us to Somerset type thing. Right. Um, they stayed there in Jenkins on the camp, and which it was out in the middle of nowhere, which was probably good. That way they all could communicate and, and everything. Sure, sure. Um, and kind of get away from all the, all the craziness. But Jenkins, you know, is like a small, small town too. Right. Is it <clears> bigger? Or, or it's smaller than Pikeville. Than, yeah. Is it bigger than Hellier, you think? Oh, yeah, it's bigger than Hellier, yeah. But it's still further a distance away. Um, but one thing I thought was interesting was some of the roads, when they show them driving down the roads and, and like, even showing the town and stuff, I was like, I know all those places. I've been on those roads. Hey, I know that curve and they go around the big rocks. So I was like, hey, you know. So to me, that was interesting, seeing kind of familiarity with especially something associated like this that we're into. Right, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, But, you know, you go back and they went to the house. And I guess, I guess maybe what I'm trying to say here is, you know, Greg and Dana, they, they live in Cincinnati, you know, they lived up in Canada. They haven't lived or spent the majority of their lives like you and I have in sure. Kentucky. Or in a rural in a area rural like area. Eastern Kentucky. And they were kind of shocked and, and they was taking some things maybe being odd, like the house looked like they just got up and left. Right. And people live in things like that, you know, and I think a little bit, they maybe needed somebody um, with them that was familiar with the area a little bit to help guide them and put them right. on, on the track of, you know, this is what it is. But when they got on the back, I guess on that thing, they talked about the house, you know, the guy, this um, David um, Christie guy emailed them and said, you know, I'm picking up my family and leaving. The aliens, you know, or the little goblins have, you know, been terrorizing right. my family, scaring my in. children. Um, there was a couple, one thing that stood out for me in this. He said they took my dog. They did. He did take his dog. Yeah. I forgot about the yeah. dog. And what is the common theme of even like a rural county? 
Oh, the one dog. Dogs. One dog just fell over dead, and the other dog was missing. Missing? Well, hell, man. I mean, what about all the dogs that uh, disappeared? You know, on that we track that you tracked on topics before topics went yeah. offline. Yeah. What about all those animals that had just yeah. disappeared? Right, and that follows these type of creatures and sightings. And this whole Pikeville um, goblin thing was all over topics for Pikeville. The Pikeville monsters. The Pikeville Goblins. What all was on there? I, I, um, Bigfoot. Everything. So it was all from Eastern Kentucky. All, all of, of this All stuff. Eastern Kentucky. It, and honestly, it, it even was talking about the booms over there. And Really? A, but a lot of it, a lot of the booms over there, they they wrote it off as being um, mining stuff. Right, right. Which, right. The, you know, the mining stuff goes back to, you know, the stuff Greg and Dana and all them was going with, talking about going into old abandoned mines. Sure, south. sure. And that's maybe where these goblins were going into. Right, right. Um, they had, I guess, some trouble navigating to um, this David Christie's house, trying to find it because he didn't give an address or anything. He just said, right. I live in Hillier. And Hillier's probably, you know, you know, Hillier isn't like saying, I live in Hillier and they're going to find him. You know, at the little signpost that says Hillier. Hillier's spread out over the hills and hollers. And, you know, maybe even this house, you know, took a four-wheel drive or something. Because there's homes, you know, in our area that you have to drive up a creek and go to where people, like, live in old abandoned homes and stuff. Right. Maybe this David Christie cab was squatting somewhere. Sure, sure, sure. You know. Very possibility. And, well, it's like you and I said, and, 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 um... You definitely found out more about Christy that, uh, or presumably something more about Christy. Um, but, uh, it's, it's very possible. You know, I know that, I know that, uh, in, in Hellier, they said of Christy, they said, you know, we've got this guy who's lived here all his life. If anybody was going to know it was this guy yeah. and he didn't, but I don't necessarily agree with that. Just living in Russell Springs, and I mean, of course, Russell Springs is much, 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 much bigger than Hillier, but Windsor's not, right. I wouldn't say, right? Like, the well, community I'd say, that yeah, I'd say Windsor and Hillier's probably very comparable in size, right. yeah. And I don't know about, you know, um, remoteness. I'd say Windsor's a little more, you know, Open, yeah. active than, than Hillier. And, and, of course, Windsor's the community that I live in and, and that Stephen has, you know, lived in around most of his life and in most of his life. Um, so, but, and, and we're, um, in central Kentucky, so it's similar to, to this place, but you know, I don't think I wouldn't, I don't think I know everybody in Windsor and I don't think, uh, even the elderliest elders of Windsor would know everybody, yeah. you know, and especially somebody, let's say that they were driving to Pikeville to work. Right. You know, I don't think that they would necessarily. Or even driving up to, um, West Virginia somewhere. Driving over right. to Logan, West Virginia, right across the border there, or driving up to Huntington. Sure. You know. Well, that uh, that actually brings up a the nice segue to my next point. Hellier is on pretty close to the West Virginia border. Yeah, and right. where Pikeville's located, it's on the side of Kentucky, and actually, you've got West Virginia kind of to the north. Right. And then down here on the bottom, around Elkhorn City, actually Elkhorn City's right on the border, I think, of Virginia there. And then you got a beautiful park there called um, Breaks Interstate Park. Um, it's National a, Park? It's a state park um, mm. that's shared between Virginia and Kentucky. It's the only shared okay. park. It's one of the only shared state parks in the nation, I think. Wow. Yeah. But the reason I asked this, and, um, well, I'll just, I'll just put all this together. Um, you know, I'll, I'll throw this all at you at once. Um, it, also in the Midnight Children, Dana and Greg are talking about when they went to Cave City with yeah. this comedian from, from Nashville. Yeah, you know what? And I forgot about them going to Cave City. Yeah. yeah. They're talking about going to, Na they're talking about going to Cave City, exploring these caves and stuff. And this little girl comes up to him after the production is over. And she says, you guys are monster hunters. And Greg says, yeah, yeah. Have you seen any monsters? And the little girl says, I see monsters all the time. And of course, Greg's a little skeptical. He's looking around to see. But it's obviously nobody has put her up to this. Um, he says, well, can you draw them for us? And the little girl draws a Kentucky goblin. Says yeah. that her friend sees them coming out of the caves. Um, she draws the footprints. Said that she's seen the footprints. 
So, um, Greg says that he's made friends with Mary Sutton, one of the original, um, uh, uh, she was seven years old at the time that the Hopkinsville Kelly incident happened. She was in the house. Um, but he, he's made friends with Mary Sutton and, uh, he asked Mary, he said, you know, after finding out about this goblin in this cave, he asked Mary or this goblin siding next to this cave after they've, they've, after they built up enough evidence to say that these goblins may be coming from these caves. Um, he asked Mary um, if there was a cave close to where the Kelly Hopkinsville incident happened. Yeah. And she said at the time, she said, I don't know, I'll have to ask some people. But uh, she got back to him a few days later, and there was a cave entrance almost exactly where the UFO was supposed to have landed. Yeah. Um, so this connects a lot of things here. This connects Hopkinsville through the Mammoth Cave System to Hellier, which is opposite, yeah. the complete opposite side of the state. Um, but my question is, so they were talking about the brown lots, the brown mountain lots, and of course in West Virginia, we have Point Pleasant, we have mm. Flatwoods from the Flatwoods Monster. Does the Mammoth Cave system run up to Brown Mountain Well, in North Carolina? <laughs> See, the one thing I've, I've always heard in the Mammoth Cave system is huge, and they're still finding parts of it, because they don't know exactly where it all runs. Right. On the map they show on Hellier is, it goes all the way up up to Vermont, right. the way it looked. And he said, you know, you can track all these creature signs to the cave system. Right, and that's why I didn't understand, because when he said that, they showed these newspaper clippings of, yeah. of the Flatwoods Monster. Um, so does it run that way? Now, when I think when we say, like, cave, I don't th I think it runs up that way and spreads out that far, but it's not like a cave like you and I can walk in. Right, right. You know, right. there's like the little caves and stuff that yeah. possibly are, are, they don't even know really how right. far these things go. Um, but I did find it odd that, you know, you know, all this stuff kind of revolved around the, you know, one of the biggest cave systems in the world there. Sure. Yeah. Um, yeah. and that's almost like a transportation thing. And that kind of ties back into the booms. If you, when that map come up, I was like, oh my God. That's where all the booms have been happening. Everywhere that they had in red that what the cave systems were, the booms have happened around that area. Really? Yeah. Huh. Because I, I kind of at one point when, you know, topics up and I was just kind of doing a quick searches on the internet, uh, yeah. custom queries to see which communities in Kentucky had reports of booms. I was kind of writing them down and putting them in a spreadsheet. And... And then kind of organizing them, you know, right. and time frame and, and where they went in Kentucky, you know, you know, the direction. And it was pretty much like, not, it probably didn't cover that whole area because not everything was reported, but still that map kind of followed what I had. That's still pretty interesting. Yeah, I thought I mean, that, it was kind of, man, it's like one of those little moments like, oh, crap, I wish that was yeah. still available. I could really do some deep digging on that. That's still pretty intense. Yeah. Um. I, I just wonder if the cave system, and I mean, I, I, I obviously it can be, but uh, I wonder if the cave system runs up under Brown Mountain, or if it runs, you know what I mean? And I'd say it's connected somehow, right. especially, you know, because I mean, they don't know how it runs, but I would say it is connected, you know, all, all that area, right. because if you think this whole area, the, which, you know, Western Kentucky is not the Appalachia, but the whole Appalachia area has reports of these things. Always oh, yeah. yeah. Um, but one thing I thought was interesting is they were talking in some of these caves, there was like drawings. Yes. And yeah. Yeah. Um, well, hell, let's get into that. Um, there was uh, the the Chief Cornstalk drawing. Yeah. Which, according to the Mothman legend, Chief Cornstalk was a, may, according to some theories, is the reason that Point Pleasant was Right. And the reason the Mothman's in Point Pleasant. And apparently, uh, Hellier is the same land that yeah. Cornstalk claimed as Point Pleasant was. 
it's up in that, you know, that's still in that mountain range. And there. that brings up the, I mean, that, that goes back to these Native American, uh, you know, legends that we, that we talk about yeah. on a lot of episodes. Yeah. The cornstalk connection was very interesting to me. And the thing of it is, is I've never bought much into the cornstalk thing in the Mothman. Like, I always thought, you know, maybe that's just a coincidence or whatever, which how many coincidences are too many. Exactly. But when I heard that there were cornstalk drawings in Hellier, and with this connection to the Point Pleasant and with Cornstalk's connection to Point Pleasant, that struck my attention. Yeah. That that was weird. That puppet that was, was weird, too. Yeah. Yeah. And especially the rest of the... They said that they found weird eyes and, yeah. and all kinds of odd stuff on those caves in Hellier, so... Yeah. Um, but um, that brings us kind of to these... Back to these Terry Wrist emails. Yeah. Um, and the emails... Um, and it, and it kind of brings us back to John Keel. Terry Wrist apparently, um, in February of 2013, contacts um, David, or I'm sorry, contacts Greg Newkirk in uh, his first email, and this is, I think we, we mentioned this earlier, says, uh, why did you stop when you were so close? I have something for you. One week. Um, so Greg replies, who is this? Um, exactly one week later, a second email arrives. Hellier was just a symptom. The ink and the black are isolated steel in third order MIA. Bear in mind, for every door closed, a window must be opened. The door is closed. The window is open. Use the number S. And it also contained the photo, which is in Hellier, of the Brown Mountain coordinates. Um, so... Like Greg says in, in Hellier documentary, and like he says in We Can Weird, the only place he can find any mention of Terry Wrist is in the Secret Cipher of the Euphonauts. Um, now, the Secret Cipher of the Euphonauts, in episode two, I believe, um, as they're going down the road, Carl realizes that Ink in the Black is mentioned in Secret Cipher of the Euphonauts, and is mentioned in relation to Ingrid Cole. So... The ink in the black is said to represent Indrid Cold, who in the who in at the same time the Mothman was going on, the Mothman incident in sixty seven was happening. Um, Bam, a man by the name of uh, Woody Derenberger ha- was said to have met Indrid Cold. Uh, said Indrid kept in touch with Woody his whole life. Was even supposedly at his funeral. Um, but this ink and black was said to be a code name in this cipher. And again, ladies and gentlemen, we are taking a big leap into esoterica. But as I mentioned in my review of the first episode, and as we've talked about on here many times, I don't really think we are going to get any answers on any of these things unless we take these leaps. I I feel like they are directly correlated. But um, Indrid Cold is mentioned as the ink and black by Terry Wrist in Secret Cipher of the Euphonauts. Not only that, but this Secret Cipher that the title refers to and that Terry refers to is a cipher that was given to Aleister Crowley, same Aleister Crowley that we talked about way back in season one for contacting an entity that was very reminiscent of the greys that we see today, known as Lamb. The secret cipher was given to Aleister Crowley in the Egyptian desert um, by another entity, another ultra-terrestrial, named, and I'm going to butcher this name, Oasis. A-W-I-S-S. Um, the cipher has been used, supposedly, and unfortunately I don't know enough about the cipher. I'm, I'm slowly getting into it. I've got Secret Cipher of the Euphonauts on my phone. I'm starting to read. But um, the cipher was supposedly used by um, the author of the Secret Cipher of the Euphonauts, um, Alan, Alan Greenfield. It was supposedly used by Alan Greenfield not only to find out when events were going to happen, but, um, even the names of some of these entities that were involved. He says in, in one podcast or in one radio interview that he does, um, which I'll include in the show notes, that he has a 90% accuracy of using the cipher to indicate when, when paranormal events are going to happen. Um, so I found it. And, and honestly, it was one of the most fascinating parts of me on the documentary was that yeah. the cipher led us back to Aleister Crowley. After oh. all the things that we went to, 
we are led back to Aleister Crowley in a case that happens right here, pretty much in our backyard. Yeah, I thought that was pretty fascinating. Right, and not only that, but uh, if you remember the ATIB, the whole advanced aerospace, advanced aerospace threat identification program, their initial, um, one of their initial objectives was to determine a way to track anomalous events yeah. like this. So is that the cipher? Is that, you know, is that the same cipher that Terry Rist is supposedly speaking to Greg Newkirk and, and in here? Or I, I don't know. The cipher is very interesting. It was know? very, yeah. Uh, that was kind of an intriguing part of the documentary. Right. But then, you know, it didn't really lead them anywhere no. or hasn't led them anywhere that we know of yet. Yeah, right. right. So I don't know. I don't know. Um, but like I said, that's the cipher is very interesting, and it's very interesting that um, it's the same cipher that was given to Aleister Crowley in the Egyptian desert by one of these supposed ultra terrestrials. And I also found it interesting. I don't know if you noticed, but at the very end of the docu series, when they're zooming out, there is that little image of a lamb right mm -hmm. there. Yeah, and I don't know what that was about, but I'm, I'm, I don't know. I think they kind of was kind of saying, you know, hinted at the connection. What's that? Uh, it, I, I just wonder what, what that was and why. And yeah. I wonder what their ideas on the connection to all this are. Yeah. I know Dana says that she thinks it's some type of elemental creature or fairy, which definitely down with, because there's all these instances of these babies crying in this cave, and that's yeah. definitely a fairy trick. Which we have that right down the road on the ghost road yeah. near us, you know? Yeah, so exactly. Makes you wonder. And, you know, you have a lot of those stories that comes out of the Eastern Kentucky right, about yeah. the baby crying. The Octavia Hatcher case. Was there a baby in that? Or? I don't think there was there, but there's a lot of like um, Mo William, um, William Leonard Montel ghost stories. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, or throughout Kentucky and even over in there. That yeah. I'm pretty sure there was babies crying. Right. And and that's just kind of, and that's even like an old wives tale if you heard a baby cry or something. It, yeah, in something. the forest it was a fairy or something yeah. luring you to it. Yeah. Yeah. But um, with John Kill, and the way this all connects is, is that John Kill got these letters from the international bankers that were very much like these Terry Rist emails yeah. that were spelled the same way, used the same cipher that, you know, Aleister Crowley supposedly developed. Um, eventually, there will be a full show on the cipher because I really think there's something there. But um, you you said earlier, you know, you were talking about um, the uh, fish and wildlife. Yeah. Do you think it's a group, maybe like these international bankers, that is is telling these people what to say, or do you think it's a more? I I don't know if it is possibly something that could go that deep, right? Right. Um, that controls things, you know, as far as the information flow. Um, I think a lot of the news stations are afraid to run stories because of advertisers afraid, you know. Advertiser pull things, but as far as like the small town cops and things not talking about it and not wanting to deal with it, I think that's kind of, I think that's interesting. Oh, yeah. For sure. and, and the only way probably to find out is truly be in those type of positions and be like, yeah, that's why we don't talk about it. You know, one thing that I, I've always heard, and I know you've probably heard this too, but when they, the Roswell wreckage, of course, they took it to yeah, yeah, their yeah. right pad up in Dayton, is they transported it underground. I have heard that, yeah. yeah. Underground tunnel. Yeah. Which would have been almost right up through Mammoth Cave. Right, right. right. And, and I guess, you know, on the cave system, I mean, this is kind of a odd theory that I had, but, you know, you have Terry Rest, which is Terry. Right, right, right. Um, he's talking about underground alien bases and everything. So, you know, that's what we've been blowing up over in Afghanistan for the past, I don't know, hell, 20 years? Near right. 20 years. Right. Um, blowing up those caves and the tunnels and everything. And I'm thinking, okay, are we really fighting Islamic militants or are we blowing up? But, you know, there are people so that... That say that they have been eradicating alien bases in the Middle East. Yeah, that's a common not I wouldn't say common, but it's a it's been mentioned before several times. Yeah. So is that what we're doing? You know.
You know you were right when you said I changed Seen some shit to probably make you go insane I got some questions better left with the bullet shells But I kept one in the chamber so I could ask it myself If you knew I was dying, would it change you? If you knew I was dying, would it change? If you knew I was dying, would it change you? The moon's all changed now, I know that you can feel it I've watched villains become heroes and heroes turn into villains I've seen this puzzle wars full of hearts of men That I fought the world with since back when we was kids Seen towns and motherfuckers sell their soul for fame I ain't casting no blame, I'm just discussing the game Got too much love to ever drop their name But I cannot confidently say I wouldn't do the same I got confidence in the providence bestowed upon me Only God can judge, I'm just a flawed human being I got these new dudes wanting about someone to spit in the booth When they ask me what to tell them, I said tell them the truth This is all what you make it, it ain't what it makes you I've seen guys lose their minds at the first sign of a breakthrough Spend my whole adult life, repping the same crew But go through what I've been through, let's see if it change you What would it be like to know you were gonna die tonight? When I pulled out the pistol, would you just close your eyes? Think back to the way the sun felt in the summertime Think back to the way your girl felt the very first time You may catch me in a blank stare thinking about the future And in five years I'll probably be trying to find my shooter Cause Lord knows that Benz makes some enemies Lord knows some men's been loading clips on me I know my face been in some places that it need not be But I got faith that times can change like we gon' see Like you know me, I know you know my team I know that all that gleams ain't gold and some gold don't gleam I know one man's trash is another man's treasure I know one man's pain is another man's pleasure But no regard the of all that, my skill is beyond measure. I know that you can feel it. There's a change in the weather. I see good men go out and I'm banging a blaze. I know everyone blasphemes and everyone prays. I know last curtain only opens up for so many days. The only thing of which I'm certain is everything will change. If you knew I was dying, would it I know you'll never understand. I'll never be the same. If you knew I was dying, would it change? But that's okay. You're just afraid of change. If you knew I was dying, would it change you? If you knew I was dying, would it change? These images, snapped by Alan Epling, has the man stumped. And that's saying something coming from a long-time amateur astronomer. I know a satellite when I see it. I track satellites with my ham radio and the telescope. But this object is like nothing he's ever seen. We were just sitting around talking, and uh, she said... There's a strange airplane in the sky. So Epling went to take a closer look. Like you had a giant mirror in the sky reflecting sunlight. And he saw something very different. And so I thought, well, there's a tiny helicopter or plane hovering up there. I'm going to look at it. I got my binoculars out. And when I looked through the binoculars, I was stunned. <laughs> this was no helicopter. And this was no plane. And... Uh, in fact, this is what I saw. For two and a half hours, he watched and photographed this object as it hung in the air until eventually it disappeared. And he wasn't alone. Police say they received numerous calls, and Epling found other observers online. You, you ask me if I think it's an earthly origin. All that's left to ask, what is it? <laughs> I think so, yes. By definition, it remains an unidentified flying object. And it's still, it's still a UFO until it's identified. Covering the news in Pike County, Adam Weiner, LEX 18 News. Alan Epling and the local newspaper made calls to the Air Force and to local airports. So far, no one has claimed responsibility for the mysterious object. On the on the uh, subject of the cipher, and, and on this subject in general, you know, jumping into this esoteria, I've seen a lot of people online that were very against the esoteric use in Hellier. And, and I'm not down with that. I've seen a lot of you ufology people that are very much about the nuts and bolts of ufology that were very dismissive of the esoteric and yeah. used in hell. And I don't understand that. I don't either. And But it it brings me to, um, while I was researching the cipher, Aleister Crowley cipher, I stumbled upon a message board post on Above Top Secret. And it was somebody who had said, you know, the secret cipher of the Euphonauts is very important to ufology, maybe one of the most important books to ufology. 
And a lot of these nuts and bolts ufology people were like, fuck this, this is gobbledygook, this makes no sense to me. Very, very, very dismissive of it. And I was kind of shocked. I mean, I don't guess I should have been because it's the internet and people, the internet acts that way. Yeah. But I was kind of shocked that, you know, these people that are devoted to something that most people don't even believe in in the first place were so dismissive of this guy and his. Right. But it also kind of showed me that the UFO community at large is very dismissive of esoterica and does not want to to include it with their UFOs. Right. It's almost like the two communities are so decisive with each right. other. They just dismiss each other's ideas. Right. That if we maybe come together, we might be able to find sure. an explanation for it. And it even goes into this interview with Alan Greenfield on this radio show. He said, you know, I had friends in ceremonial magic that told me I needed to stop talking about UFOs. Mm -hmm. So it makes you wonder what the UFO connection is there as well, you know? Yeah. And... You know, even though there was this UFO crash, supposedly, crash in Hopkinsville when these goblins come out the first time in 1955, I'm not sure if UFOs are the nuts and... And, I mean, I don't have to tell you this, and I don't want to tell the audience this, because if you've listened to me before, you know this. I'm not sure UFOs are these nuts and bolts craft that we think they are, and I'm not sure any spacecraft landed at helicopter. Kelly Hopkinsville, or if it wasn't just some portal opening over this cave, or something to exactly. that effect, which I know I throw portals out there a lot, but you know. yeah, because I mean, if you think about it, a UFO is comparable to what you would think a portal is. It's a big thing of light, sure, and you know, and it's sure it has a form. And in his in in his interview today, Alan Greenfield had a really good point. He said, you know, these things have been with us since the dawn of time. Yeah. Why do we think they're from space? They have no reason to be from space. They've been here with yeah. us since the beginning. They have no reason to be from yeah. outer space. It, it, it may be the, these creatures and these entities was here before us humans were. Sure. Like and a praetor yeah. society or something. Something yeah. fought long, long yeah. ago. Yeah, billions of years ago. Sure. And we just kind of happen to take over the Earth at some point in history. Or we populated it. Yeah, populated They're still, it right. and forced them underground. Sure, sure. Yeah. Um, but on this above top secret form, um, this this poster called Magic Master, which I know that's the most professional sounding name in the world, but Magic Master actually, and that's with a K for all you mm -hmm. Aleister Crowley aficionados out there, um, has this to say about the cipher, and I feel like he he puts it he he breaks it down really well. So I'm gonna read this. Magic Master, whoever you are, thank you for this. You contributed to our research heavily. I'm gonna quickly read Magic Master's little synopsis of this. So Magic Master says this on the ATS message board. He says, either A, Aleister Crowley, having written the Book of Law, which is the book that the cipher appears in, has created a new cipher of communication between high adept occultists, which became the new wave of ascended masters channeled through UFO contactees, or B, Aleister Crowley, having written the Book of Law, channeled a higher level dimensioner entity, AWIS, and let me quickly say that I spelled that wrong before, it is A-I-W-A-S-S, -S, AWIS, which imparted to him the new cipher, which would be used to bring communication from the higher dimensional entities, which we now consider to be UFO occupants from from various star systems. Hypothesis, hypothesis A makes much more sense because it's more likely that Crowley created a secret communication for high-level magical adepts to communicate with each other than the ideal that some aliens or demons imparted to Crowley a code which would be used by other entities like Hilarion, Ashtar, Bashar, R.A. and Set to communicate high-level spiritual information about alien life on other planets and the future of humanity. So, what this guy's saying is either A, or, or my interpretation of this, this fellow's deal is, either A, Aleister Crowley creates this code or gets this code for other magicians to interpret and to... Mm -hmm. But, that's the thing. The cipher has shown us where these anomalous activities, or according to Alan Greenfield where these anomalous activities will happen. So either A, Crowley has gotten this code for all of these magicians to understand better where these things are going to happen, right. or he has gotten it from an extra-dimensional entity who has given us, him this code to see where these anomalous events are going to happen. Yeah. And I know we're getting a little bit off subject, but I, I really think that this has some bearing on this case, and it makes me wonder, 
why these magicians would need this code in the first place. Why yeah. we would need to know where these anomalous events happen. What were they? What are they going to do with it? Sure. Yeah. And to lead us back to Kel, or to lead us back to Hellier, why does this code come in with Terry Rist in this situation? Right. This supposed military warrior. He's he's not a magician. He's a soldier, right. or according to his like a mercenary. Type yeah, right. Thing. So why is he using this magical code? And why is he using this magical code to talk to Greg Newkirk? Right. Same code that the international bankers use to talk to John Keel with. Exactly. What's the purpose behind that communication? Right, right. Why Why bring that into this case? Yeah. You know what I mean? But I don't know. I found that odd, and, and I really feel like there's something with a cipher in this case that would, you know, that there's something there. There's yeah. Something there. Especially with all the other synchronicities that are involved in it. Right. It's almost like they was leading them to there. Maybe Greg and Dana was like a missing piece to the to the algorithm. There sure, sure. For it to complete a cycle. Right. And once they complete the cycle, that's when everything gets stopped. Right. And that's what they say in episode five. They say, you know, when they were in the cave and, and they said it just felt like all of a sudden something turned itself off to us. Yeah. And it was done. And it was over. And... um I do think that whatever this is, whatever this algorithm is, whatever creates these synchronicities, it does use us as pieces. It yeah. uses us as pieces to put us in places that we need to be for another event to happen. Right. And it's uh, it's very much like um, like uh, they're told by um, oh now I forgot his name. They're told by their. They're, uh, they call them at the end of the documentary. We just listened to the... Oh, yeah. What's the guy's name? Um, I don't say it's Paul, but it's not Can't Paul. remember to yeah. save my life. He's actually a decently renowned researcher. But they're told at the end of the Heller documentary um, by this guy, they're told, you know, they, he, he tells them, he's like, you did nothing wrong. This is how these things happen. And and for me, and I'll go ahead and say it, uh, and, I, and I love Greg and I love Dana and I love the research they do, but... About episode four, I had a point where I was like, so we're not really going to get to see anything here, are we? Nothing's. But episode five really drew it to a good conclusion for me and really reinforced something that I think that a lot of us in the paranormal community miss. There is no closure to these things. There's no closure to what happened in 1955 in Kelly Hopkinsville, and there's probably not going to be any closure to what's happening in Hellier now. No. The reason for these things to happen is so we're we're allowed to witness them, or at least it seems that right. way. And it definitely seems like these people are brought to these places to be shown these things or to experience these things. Yeah. So maybe that's what the synchronicities yeah. are. Maybe it, that's... And even if like these creatures made themselves available, I don't think you would be able to capture one or make one, you know. You couldn't put it in a cage. You couldn't put it in a cage. You couldn't kill it. Right. Um, because honestly, I think maybe those who have tried or possibly got close are maybe the ones who disappear sure. without a trace. Well, so you, th so you're kind of in line with Dana here. You think that maybe these things are less of a physical entity and more of something ethereal or more of something spiritual. Yeah. Not they, necessarily spiritual, but. There, there's something that's being called, you know, up at some point, right? Either through magic, or through just the way things work, and we don't the realize weird it. The weird way the reality works. Um, but one that I keep going back to is, you know, and if you go back to like the early, early human days, right? They talk about Hades and all these demons and stuff. Sure. Where do they, where do they come from? Come from the underground. underground. Yeah. Right. Like we talked about last week with the Mammoth Cave. Yeah. yeah. They all come from underground. Yeah. So, you know, this is obviously, these type of things have been going on since humanity is able to communicate. You right. know, cave drawings. You know, They've been here with us down. forever. They've been here with us forever. They exist on this earth. Right. We may want to accept it or not, but we're not alone. You know, on right. this earth, it ain't just the humans and the animals and working on the ark. There's something else with us. That could be anything from another species or a whole different type of yeah. entity itself. Yeah, and maybe there's a whole civilization inside the earth and 
and the way they explore it is the same thing as us going to outer space. Sure, sure, sure. And that's a big theory. I mean, that's a big theory that there's another. I mean, I know it's kind of crazy and probably could probably could easily be debunked. But, but just but... today, man, they found that uh, that uh, hollow inside of Antarctica that's two thirds the size of Manhattan. Did you hear about I that? I did not hear about that. Yeah, there's a hole in Antarctica, two thirds of the size of Manhattan. That's interesting. And you know, there's always been that hollow earth theory about these creatures coming up from the middle of the earth. Yeah. That was the flat earth theory before flat earth come along. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It really was. Like, that was, that was. But, um, no, I'm, I'm completely with you on that. I, I definitely, I don't think it's aliens. I don't think it's extraterrestrials. And I think anybody that, and I mean, no offense by this, but I think anybody that thinks it is, hasn't done enough research. Yeah. For sure. Yeah, so there, de- there's definitely something like they're from another dimension, some the spiritual thing going on. Right. But they're coming from somewhere, I'm kind of like you, not space, but did you catch the part where they was talking about the, um, the intergalactic government and stuff in this? No, documentary? no, no. What was it? They, I, I may have just... It was like a real short comment, like, you know, these are aliens that they, um, there's only a select humans that have known about it. The Third Order. Yeah, yeah this goes order, back yeah. to the Cipher. Yeah. The Third Order, according to... Uh, the Third Order is mentioned in the International Banker Letters and everything. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's right. Yeah, yeah, that, yeah. The bankers, and that yeah. they're no longer active. Yeah. That they're no longer active. And i got to be honest with you. I need to do more research into the Cipher thing because I didn't really understand all that. Didn't really understand I the whole either. Third Order thing. But, again, it goes back to Aleister Crowley and all of his crazy-ass bullshit, man. Yeah. It, all roads lead to Aleister Crowley, it seems like. Exactly. Like, they really do. Does yeah. it not seem like that? It all does. Roads all this stuff ties back, back to, to him. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, I mean, I don't want to give the man more credit than he's than mm-hmm. he's worth. I'm sure, you know, he's just a human being. But it definitely does seem like the great beast was onto something here. Exactly. Or he was involved. With, I don't know. But all of it leads back to Aleister yeah. Crowley somehow. But speaking of, of odd esoteric things, what'd you think about the spirit box? What'd you think about Connor's spirit box? <clears throat> On things like that, I mean I'm not knocking anything. Sure, sure. Um but it's up to the own person's interpretation. It's very subjective. It, to me it, it's the same thing as and okay. I'm gonna preface this. Send you hate mail already. <laughs> Send it to Midnight in Kentucky <laughs> Podcast at gmail dot com, right. or hit us up on Twitter. The spirit box to me is no different than, and I'm not saying it's real, or not real, sure, sure, but it's up to interpretation. No different than someone having a vision or anything else in a church. Fair enough, but dude, that's a big statement. Yeah, <whistles> unpack that for us. Yeah, it, <laughs> it could be. It's cool how you look at it. And it's quite the only person that gets it. Very true. Which which I think is a lot of the reason that these nuts and bolts ufologists threw it out immediately. Yeah. Because you may get the sensation that you're getting something. But the mind can play tricks on you. It's kind of like sure. being in a dream state. You sure. know, the mind's just going to give you whatever it wants to give you. Right. Um, maybe something was controlling it. Um, maybe something wasn't. Right. But there's so much of this case like that. There's so much of this yeah. case. And I even think that Greg mentions that in episode five. He says, there was a lot of the time that we were in Hellier that it felt like I was in a dream state. It's weird yeah. that you bring up that dream state yeah. comment because he, he does mention that. And I guess I guess with the tin can thing was a little... Well, let's talk about the tin can. Yeah. Connor says that while he was doing the spirit box deal which which i find interesting regardless if yeah. it's and i find it interesting that he and carl were the inventors of the spirit box deal yeah. as far as i can tell that may not be accurate i think they said that yeah yeah and i'm pretty sure i read it in in uh, one of their biographies somewhere online today but um so while connor's doing the spirit box he has this vision of this tin can yeah. And he really leans into this vision of this tin can. Which at first I was a little... Uh, I thought it was a little uh, weird. Uh, right. Yeah. But then, in some residual research I was doing, and and I, the tin can stuck with me for some reason. Despite thinking it was odd, and despite thinking it was out of place, I was like, yeah. hmm. But then, and I don't know if this is connected, I don't know if this is a synchronicity, I don't know what this is. I'm just going to throw it out there. 
the original Kelly Hawkinsville case, when Lucky and um, when Lucky and I can't remember the other dude's name, but when they shot at him, yeah, they said, and this is a direct quote, they said that the bullets sounded like they were hitting tin cans. Yeah. So I mean that's. And I'm surprised that nobody brought that up, because that, well, immediately, when I was doing yeah. research and I saw that tin can thing with Kelly, I was like, tin can? Oh, fuck. And, and, you know, that's interesting, because since you say that, you know, and then, you know, in the end, there they find the tin can in the cave. Right, right, right. And, and you know, to me, I was kind of like, okay, what else is in the cave? Is the tin can, is that the only thing in there? Right. And it certainly looked like it was. Yeah, it but... looked like it was. And so I'm going to take them at their word at that. But isn't that like a synchronicity within itself sure. of saying, look, I'm connected to Kelly. This is the exact same thing. Right. And then it ends. Very you know, that, true. That Very true. So you think that the tin can was the end? I think the tin can was the symbolism of saying, you know, maybe, you know, with that quote, we're the same thing that was in Kelly, Kentucky. Well... On the spirit box, and I'm still not totally sure how I feel about yeah. the spirit box. And I'm going to go ahead and say this. Carl, Connor, Greg, Dana, we would love to talk to all of you all about this stuff. If you would ever want to talk to us about it, feel free to get in contact with us or tell us how much you hate all of our theories. Again, Midnight Kentucky Podcast at gmail.com. But <laughs> um, I'm not sure how I feel about the spirit box, but I will say this. When Greg asked him, um, when Greg asked him if he knew what they were there for, and he said, yes, sir, me, or yes, sir, I'm yeah. it, that was weird. That was very weird, yeah. And there were a lot of instances like that with the spirit box. There were a lot of odd things, but I still don't know how I feel about it completely. The tin can thing and the connection with Kelly did kind of hook with me. I'm still not... I'm still shocked that nobody else put that together. Though. Yeah. That's I'm, a pretty big... To me, it is, at least. I don't know. It, it, to me, it's significant, too, since you bring that up. Right. Because, I mean, right. that really ties things together. Um, yeah. So, I mean, because what else significance would the team can be? Right. 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 Yeah. But, um, leaving that behind, let's get into what is possibly my favorite part of this case where we start to come into it and where we start to connect yeah. with these synchronicities. So uh, I was sitting there reading over my notes today, getting stuff together. Was it today or yesterday? Uh, sometime in the past week, Steven sends me a text and he's like, uh, uh, so something along the lines of, I uh, can't remember exactly what you said, but uh, basically we may have found or we may have located. We have two separate possibilities on who David Christie, the elusive man who uh, disappeared, who had who had messaged Greg Newkirk in the first place on on just who this David Christie fellow might be. I'll let Stephen tell you guys about that. Right. So, of course, naturally, I took to the Internet and I was like... That's what you do. Okay. Who is this David Christie fellow? Because honestly, they, the more part, I guess, let's back up. The more part of the email, they start trying, or one part of the documentary, they start trying to track back the email. The IP, yeah. The and as IP soon as I saw that IP thing, I was like, oh my God, Stephen's going to be screaming about this. I was like, literally, like, screaming. At, I was watching my phone, like, reaching to my phone. Like, <laughs> what are you people doing? And of course, they called IT guy Steve. Uh -huh. Which is another synchron that's another yeah. small level synchronicity I there. I thought that was, I thought that was kind of funny. <laughs> But I was like, okay, for one, IP address is going to be spooked. They're sure. very easily spooked. Sure. I can make my IP address come from wherever in the hell I want to. I can be in Afghanistan and send you an email. Right. You know, it, it's kind of like what Rick says, you know, it could be a hologram. It could be a clone, <laughs> you know. I recently watched that episode. Yeah, yeah. You know, I'm Doctor Who. I'm Doctor Who in this <laughs> motherfucker. <laughs> exactly. So, I'm like, okay, first of all, just scrap that whole IP thing. The one thing I wish they did, though, is... If they took the pictures, right, and they looked at the metadata of those pictures, and hey, if y'all listening to this, look at the metadata. If you have not done that yet, I would look at the metadata of the pictures, right? Um, because those could which contain pictures the the goblin photos. the goblin photos, yeah, yeah. and the foot and the footprints, yeah, because you could tell a lot by that because you could, I mean, there's a lot of forensic stuff you could do in those. You sure. could see possibly what type of camera they took them with. 
the, the see the dates all line up. Right. Um, you could even see possibly you know where they come from, what type of computer was used, what type of software was used to create them. Jeez, you can make that much on. There was a lot of it was recording what type of photo it was and format and everything it was in. Right. And the other thing with the IP address is they were saying, oh, it come from Canada. And at first I was like, okay, that's interesting. But then they was like, okay, this comes from Canada. You know, they was in Canada at the time. Right. And at that point, you know, Greg was like, okay, someone's fucked with this. Oh, he lost it, man. Yeah. I hate to say it, but. Yeah. And it just destroyed him. It and I'm did. Like, I'm like, okay. But I was sitting there like, man, this could have easily been faked. Like, that yeah. would have not have been. And I mean, I get it, dude. You're in Kentucky. You're a long way from your yeah. house. I understand being devastated at that point. But for me, that was not a devastating point. That no. was just a, somebody's trying to cover their tracks. Yeah. And. and to me, the person that covered the tracks, so this this wasn't obviously a person, you know, not knocking any money here. That was just emailing him from right. the holler in Kentucky. This person actually took some steps to hide themselves. For sure, maybe. Here's the here's kind of what I found. I, uh, you know, of course, I searched the web for David Christie, um, and I, and I te- and of course, there's thousands of those names. Oh yeah. So I kind of keyed them up with words outside of this Kentucky. Sure. You know, I did, you know, Pikeville and see if there's any. And then I thought, okay, well, maybe David Christie isn't, you know, maybe he lives somewhere else in Kentucky. So um, there's a couple of things I found. Um, and full disclosure here, this is all information on Google. And please do not, like, try to contact these people. Or, and if you did, it's not our fault. Yeah, we are not legally responsible for any <laughs> of this. Okay, so, so the first thing I found was on... You know, and you had to go pretty deep into Google. But I found, like, an obituary um, genealogy-type book right. out of Bull County, which is Junction City and Danville, up the road here. Yeah. Um, there was a person's name that come across from a person that passed away as being a grandchild. And it was David Christie. Christie was an apprentice Collins of Danville. A David Christie of Danville, Kentucky. Yeah, David Christie Collins. But Christie was in parentheses like that. was like the name maybe he went by or, you know. Middle name. Maybe middle name. Or maybe that was his former. Maybe he had, like, his mom's maiden name. Sure, sure. And then he changed his last name or that was his former last name, whatever. Because, honestly, if David Christie... This is kind of my way of thinking. If he used a thing that changed his IP address, that might not have been his real name. Right. right. So this guy's name is David Collins. And, and in the emails, this guy stated he was a doctor in Pikeville. Well, there is a David Collins doctor in Pikeville. Works for the hospital there. Right. 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 He's actually a surgeon there. Um, so you can look that up and see that. But the other odd thing I thought, okay, let's see if there's a David Christie... For mining. Right. So I typed in David Christie mining. Because, you know, a lot of these based around mines. Sure. Oh, yeah. And my mind went to, okay, maybe he's a coal miner. Maybe he worked over there. Maybe he has some type of dealings with mines. Right. And I got a hit. And there is a David Collins. He is a CEO. David he's, Christie. David Christie, yeah. Right, right. David Christie work, has worked. This David Christie has worked years in the mining industry. None of them related to eastern Kentucky that I could find. Um, but none of he, this guy's mines, really. Yeah, none of his mines are his mining company. Actually, he mines um, metals, um, like tin. Interesting. Yeah. Did it say tin on his deal? Um, it, it's more like, um, well, it's copper, or steel, and things like that mines. But you know, tin is made from that type of metal. So that's hadn't thought about that. The exercise come to that. Interesting. When we saw the tin can, it kind of popped in my head. Interesting. Um. But the interesting thing I found about this is this day it Christie comes out of his company is out of Toronto, Ontario, Canada. Which was which where, where the email come from come from Ajax, which is outside of right. Toronto there. Right. So I thought, okay, there's several things could be happening here. Sure. Um one is someone is trying to make it look like this David Christie. Right. Or he, or they, or all these keys in this, the tin can, the the mines, is they need to go to this guy and talk to him. 
David Christie. David Christie, the sure. mining guy. Sure. Um, because the communication has stopped, the emails disappeared, right. you know. So, there's a couple of theories I have. Is, one, you know, there's a university over in Pikeville. I like this one. This is my yeah. answer. There could be a professor over there. Um, and there's people over who's very capable of using a VPN. Sure. Spoofing IP addresses. Could be this David Collins. Could be the David Collins doctor over there. Right. Um, that, you know, possibly had property over in Hillier. Um, cause I was like, okay, they chose her property records. Sure. And yeah. there was nobody named David Christie that owned property. But if he was named David, David Collins, Collins that and would used be... his Christie surname, or right. Christie, whatever right. the name is. So, I-, I thought that was the case. It could be somebody, you know, over, that used a name or used, you know, or maybe David Christie's like a code name or something. Sure, sure. But another theory that you have to always put into account is there was people, maybe college kids over there at the college, that was talking about all this stuff one night while smoking some weed, and said, you know what, there. you know what, sure. these goblins and stuff, and it was like, you know what, we ought to email Dave and Greg Newkirk. And then they thought real hard about it. Well, we need to hide our tracks. Right. And and then they just maybe found this mining company up in Canada and said, well, hey, if they start digging, it's going to look like it's this guy. Right. Or, to take it to the next level of hoax, this is all... Because what I find interesting is with... with um, if, if ever going to that level... Um, what I find interesting is, is that in this instance, this Terry Wrist asked after, after they returned from the Brown Mountain Lights, after Micah Hanks had showed them this entrance, this possible alien cave base, um, Terry Wrist asked them why they gave up. Why didn't they continue? Even though this, you know, even though this Terry Wrist is using the same, um, the same word patterns, the same writing patterns as the international bankers. The international bankers were telling John Kill to stop, yeah. to stop during the research. So why is this guy telling them to continue? But but what I'm what I'm saying here is is if if David Christie is a false identity, is there the possibility? And and this is what um, this is what they're told when they when they call the guy whose name I wish I could remember. I'll put it in the show notes. But um, when they call this guy, this this researcher who's been in the field a lot longer than they have, that they respect and they, they want a little closure from, or, you know, they call him and they ask him and he says, you know, this has happened to many researchers, Albert Bender and, and John Keel and Gray Barker, who Gray Barker has some issues with, but that's a different thing for a different time. But um, it's happened to a lot of these researchers. It makes you wonder if either A, David Christie was, and I'm going to get into some heavy, crazy shit here in just a second. Either A, David Christie was a false identity used by a intelligence agent, kind of like Richard Doty, who mm-hmm. we've talked to before, to lead them in a direction that may have some truth in it, but also they were hit with so much confusing shit that they couldn't piece it apart. Or B, if Terry Wrist is not a man in black type entity, and is not some type of manifestation of the phenomena itself, which is why they talk in this weird code and they talk in these weird things and they do yeah. weird shit. And why, when they reach Hellier, they are not, um, they are given so much shit, so much strange shit that happens that they can't figure out which direction to go in because they serve their purpose at that point. Right. So, so maybe, maybe David Christie and and this Terry Risk guy are, are either the same guy, or Terry Wrist is like you said, college kids playing a prank, or he, um, or they are both manifestations of the phenomena themselves, trying to bring Greg and Dana and the crew to Hellier, right? To to see this shit like they're supposed to be, but I don't know, man. The Doctor from Pikeville, the David Collins thing. That stands out to me as 
I, that needs to be looked into. Yeah, I think they probably just need to maybe see if he owns any property in Hellier. Yeah. But here's the thing. is You bring up the intelligence community. Yeah. Here's the big thing is, what if the intelligence community hedged their bets and said, you know what, Granny Dan is probably going to do some type of web series on this, or they're going to write about this, throw this name out here. We need to come up with a name. If people started searching, they're going to think it's this person over here. And they threw this, you know, obituary genealogy page up there for Christian parentheses because I looked at that page quite extensively. There's nobody else who has a name in parentheses there. Right. So to me, that was almost like it was... That's odd. I thought, damn, that's made to stand out. Yeah, that's definitely odd. To grab your attention. Definitely odd. Because, you know, if you just type in, you know, Collins or David Christie... But it's in parentheses. I'm like, that, that, to me, that's why I was like, man, I really would like, and I did pick up and run with it. But I was like, real hesitant there towards the end because I was like, shit, it's almost like an intentional piece left there. But then. But there's so many intentional but, pieces left. Yeah. But then if you look at their dad's name, if you start researching the David, David Christie and David Collins, is like, his dad's name was Leon D. in Danville. Right. But then there was a Leon F. Collins that lived in Junction City and Pikeville. Right. So, you know, that was the weird thing. There was a synchronicity there. There was precedence for this David Christie being in Pikeville. Right. Right. So. And not only that, just throwing this out here, but F. Collins, Floyd Collins, the Mammoth Cave Explorer. Another level of synchronicity to throw Jeez, in there for you. Man, see, that's crazy. And I don't know, I mean, of course with the internet you can make it do, but the whole sure. but the whole thing with, like, the emails just disappearing, communication being cut, as soon as they get ready to head out there, as soon as they give the acknowledgement, hey, I'm heading out there, right? then he just drops everything. Yep. And he disappears. And... And people around there was like, no. But, you know, we go back to the whole thing of no one knows that. I mean, people, I don't even know some of the people who lives around here. Very true. And that's my whole thing. Like, I don't know half the people live in my community. And it's about the size of failure. I mean, you go so. down to Windsor Grocery and ask them, you know, who this person is. They might not even know. Right. I mean, right. that's just the way the world is. It ain't like the, you know, 1930s where everybody knew everybody. Right, right. Right. It's definitely not. But I will say this for the whole docuseries. Um, it does a really good job of uh, introducing Kentucky's individualism without yes. going overboard on the stereotypes. Yeah. I, they're I, very, you know, parts of it, but they're they're very respectful of the culture at large. They was. And I think there was a lot more they I'm sure they realized about the area. Oh yeah. That they could have talked about, you know, the half of McCoy thing is over there. Oh, yeah, yeah, it's yeah. a if anybody hasn't been over there, it's a beautiful area. I recommend And it's very going. historic. There's a lot of stuff that's went yeah. on over there. Yeah, former governor Paul Patton's from there. Yeah. They got a from gas, Pikeville. Yeah, from Pikeville. Yeah. Got a big ass statue there of him at the college. Um Pikeville University courses there. Right. They got an arena. You and I seen Hinder over yeah. there. But and we've been there a couple of times, haven't we? Yeah. Who else yeah. do we see over there? Maybe it was just Hinder. We seen Hinder. I think we may have seen Hinder twice over there. Yeah, they were really into Hinder back then. Yeah, the day. <laughs> back when they was these. Hey, they were yeah. good up till their last album. Yeah, but they went Christian and they kind of got crazy. Yeah, got, <laughs> that got messed up, man. Uh, but I guess the weird thing is, you know, with Pikeville is, of course, you know, we'll talk about it in a future show about like TV Hatch or things oh, yeah. the picture. I feel like that's a full show. But when we come back from Pikeville that time, the GPS messed up and was trying to send us off like down that side road. Oh, yeah. Like, yeah. like and it went up, which we didn't go because, you know, we stayed on 80 there coming out. But it was probably more up towards Jackson, but coming back from Pikeville. And it was trying to send us off like some, like little country road with yes, like a cemetery yeah. at the end of it and I didn't go but it was like middle of the night and I was like why the hell's this thing trying to take us down this road and this wasn't like Google Maps no you know this so was... this was back in Tom Tom days yeah, when GPS yeah, first come yeah, out yeah. it didn't send you like through you know this is a quicker route click here to you know and that's almost like 
it was very strange looking back on, especially for the area that we were yeah. in. We saw a lot of strange things that even yeah, that was around our, those two trees. Every time I've been in Pipers, some oddness happens. It's, it's an odd place. It's an odd, it's odd, place. odd little country place. Trip. But they did do a good job of just, you know, um, talking to the you know country folk out there. They that, represented it well. Yeah. And that little gas station reminded me so much of our little community gas station that's right down the road here. It like it, it was just straight up Kentucky. It did. Man. It was. And, and, you know... And the people, I didn't really have trouble understanding them. I'm sure a lot of people might. They kept them captions on, though, yeah, just yeah, to be sure. Yeah. And, dude, I loved how I, I have a thing for dialects and for accents, and this is demeaning in no way whatsoever. I just love to hear the way people talk. Mm-hmm. And the way that the people of Eastern Kentucky said hellier with the yeah. Y, the yeah. hellier. I love that, yeah, dude. Yeah. That was badass yeah. hellier. Yeah, it's like almost northern but yeah. southern at the same time. Yeah. Um, I think the greatest part in the documentary, though, is when they pull up the store and Greg gets up talking to people and Dana reaches over and walks yeah, the door. Yeah, 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 yeah. And I was yeah. like... We're at these toxic <laughs> gas stations every day. I was like, oh, mercy. <laughs> well, for one, lucky door is probably not going to help you. No, not in Eastern Kentucky. <laughs> no. Not in Eastern Kentucky. But, and then, plus, no, there was nothing to be scared of. But, yeah, you know. Yeah. But... <sighs> I guess coming from the city and you going out in that part. Oh, it's a different world. Yeah. It's and of course, you know, world. there's a lot of deliverance, you know, references. And let's be real without, you know, I hate it when people are like, oh, is the moonshine or is the meth or whatever. Because yeah. moonshine and meth don't make you see goblins coming out of caves, people. Right. Let's get together here. Yeah. But there's a lot of meth over in Eastern Kentucky. There's a lot and a lot of... There's a lot of crime in Eastern yeah. Kentucky. Which there's a lot of crime everywhere. It's the world over. But that one part, though, is when they was um, going yeah, in the was, cave, going yeah. through the weeds. I was like, oh, man, they're going to get someone's dope crap. They're going to get shot. I was like, you don't walk through the <laughs> well, there is a there, fields like right, that. There's, <laughs> there's a, uh, there's a uh, post now on, on their um, Kentucky Goblins post on their website that's like, if you choose to go to Hellier, we are not held liable if you are shot or <laughs> so. Yeah. Um, but let's take a quick break. Let you guys catch your breath for a second. Hear some good music. Uh, we'll be right back with our conclusions and to close this thing up. <laughs> Thank you guys so much for tuning in tonight. It's been a great conversation. Um, it's been a, it's been eye-opening. A lot of this investigation, even our part of this investigation has blown my mind. Steven, what Stevens found on this David Christie thing, it's, uh, it's definitely interesting. But before we go out, let me ask you, I got, I got two more questions on this thing. Number one, what do you think, we'll start with this one. On your best theory, what do you think is in the Eastern Kentucky Hills? What do you think these goblins are? What do you think is going on? What's your theory? What about these booms? You, you said at the beginning yeah. of the show that you felt like the booms played a part in this. Tell, I, Give us the whole thing. I think the booms are... I think there is 
definitely some type of creature or creatures. And, you know, they kind of bring this up in the Henry documentary, but maybe Bigfoot, sure. Mothman, these goblins, everything is kind of the same. I was surprised that they didn't bring up the Dogman, man. Yeah, I know. For I as many of... as, for as much Dogman, but, you know, maybe that's our Mothman. Maybe that's our Hellier. Yeah. I yeah, really felt that like, that way because yeah. I mean, me and you have centered in on that. Maybe that's our maybe that's maybe that's, that's our it. synchronicity. Yeah, but anyway, go on. But I think you know all those creatures, and, and you know they kind of disappear, and I can find them. But maybe they're going underground. And I'm thinking the booms we're hearing is possibly them. Either there's two possibilities. I think one, these creatures are moving underground and maybe expanding their territory. Sure. Or second, the military is actually blowing them up. Underground, and we're just tearing it. Some Terry Risk characters yeah. under there eradicating And we're things. in the war going on inside the Earth. That's a damn. That's a, I yeah. like that. So, what about you? What do you think? They, well, what do you think the creatures are? What do you think these oh, creatures are in themselves? I think that they. I mean, just your. Just my opinion. I think they are something that. I don't know if they're, they're mixed between maybe spiritual or another dimension, but I think they definitely hold powers that the normal human being. Does sure, not. Yeah. Sure. Now, I do believe animals are like cats, dogs, birds, stuff like that. They can see them and sense them. They're more in tune. In tune with them. Because the I think they're more tied tied into whatever these creatures are. Right. So. Um, at this point, yeah, I, I don't know if we said this earlier, if we said this off air, but I don't subscribe to the extraterrestrial hypothesis yeah. any longer. And I mean, maybe... Maybe I maybe I need to be a little more more lenient on that, but honestly, feel like at this point, every all of these people who have clung so hard to Roswell and have clung so hard to all of these things are almost just as bad as skeptics who mm-hmm. refuse to see any of it, because it's obvious to me now that whatever is happening, it's not from outer space, and if it is from outer space, then there's something else going on yeah like there's some type of interdimensional travel in space there's some type of what i'm saying is is that they're not coming here conventional or even unconventional spacecraft like i just don't believe that anymore and i'm not even sure if i believe that they are flesh and blood creatures like you were saying i think there's something ethereal i think there's something spiritual maybe but I don't even know if I don't want to reach out and touch the fact that, and and this has been touched on a lot, and in and, and no means do I mean that this is in the mind of the people who witness these things, because that's not what I mean. But I've had a lot of people say to me, well, maybe it's just like an acid trip, or it's a DMT trip, or it's something in somebody's brain that we release okay. that we don't even know that we released. I'm down with that. But the thing is, is, in a lot of these cases, like the Kentucky Goblins and all the cases that we covered, there is physical evidence of this shit having happened. Right. Like the footprints. Yeah. That is not some DMT trip. That is not some acid trip. Those are there. Regardless if they are hoaxed or not, mm-hmm. there are photos of these footprints. So there is physical evidence there. So, in a way, yeah, I do think it's kind of like an acid or a DMT trip. But I think it's... <clears throat> and this is just a theory. I'm not sure if I believe this or not. It's just a theory I've been working with. But maybe this is reality or consciousness itself expressing itself to us. To show us, much like Greg mm. and Dana were told in that final episode, you are meant to be here to witness it. That's it. There is no closure to these things. There is mm. no finalization for these things. And if we try to force finalization on these things, it's just for us. Yeah. It's not the case closing because these cases don't close. There is something happening that we may never understand and honestly think to try to understand it too much probably driven people crazy. Yeah. It's probably part of the reason Paul Benowitz went crazy. You know what? I thought about him when you were talking about that earlier. Yeah. yeah. I mean, like, and I don't even know if, you know, but I think clinging too tightly to any of these ideas or clinging too tightly to the thought that you might figure this out will drive you crazy. Because yeah. I don't think we're going to figure this no. out. No don't think we're meant to figure this out. But I do think that we're meant to study it. I do think that we're meant to witness it. I do th- think that we're meant to see it in some ways. But I don't know. I don't think that these are flesh and blood creatures any longer. I don't think we're dealing with cryptids. I don't think we're dealing with 
anything like that. I think what we're dealing with is something far beyond what we can comprehend as human beings. Yeah. And and that's not to say that we can't touch it. That's not to say that we can't try to figure it out. It's not to say that we can't have theories that might be right in some ways. But I don't think we have the ability to even begin to piece together what is actually happening. Yeah. And I think, and this is going to upset a lot of very big UFO people, but I think maybe ceremonial magicians have come closer than other people. I think people that study the esoteric and the magic have come closer to other people. But at the same time, those people have been driven insane and homeless mm-hmm. into drugs. And, I mean, hell, look at Aleister Crowley. He died a homeless heroin addict. Yeah. Which was probably a cause of his obsession with this whatever it is. And I'm not saying he didn't come close, because like we said earlier, all roads lead back to Aleister Crowley. Yeah. But what I am saying is, as human beings, whatever's happening, we don't have any control over it. Yeah. And it controls how much information it wants us to get. And to try and force that information out, I think probably makes the universe look at you and say, I'm going to fuck your shit up now. Yeah. And it does. Because yeah. it's happened over and over Happens and over. every time. It happened to Jack Parsons. happened to Aleister Crowley. happened to um, John Keel. Not that it really happened to John Keel, but John Keel quit. You yeah. know, he quit researching. He quit before he's ahead. Right, right. Um, it's happened to a lot of researchers that have just been like, I'm done. I don't know what's yeah. going on here. I know something's going on here, but it's fucked with me enough. Yeah. So, I don't know. I don't know. And I and I don't profess to know, and honestly, I don't really want it. You know, I, I want to yeah. study it. I want to right. try and figure it out. Right. But if we knew, then a lot of the, a lot of the, you know, if, I think knowing would take away whatever it is. And I don't know yeah. if that makes a lot of sense, but I, I don't think we're meant to know. And I, and I think if we did know that it would not, serve its purpose yeah well it's kind of like that bible verse that you know it says that god hasn't entered into the mind or heart or exactly you know yeah yeah we don't have the capacity yeah that. there's no way of us knowing those things right 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 and i don't think we're supposed to i really yeah. don't and maybe someone we will but i don't know yeah. i tell a lot of people a lot of the time when they ask me what i think it is i say or what any of these things are i say i think that existence is a lot fucking weirder than we think it is. Yeah. And that we don't have any idea how weird it actually is. Exactly. But my final question, and, and we'll go out on this one. Who do you think the email was from? The very end of the series. The, the Hellier ends with a close-up of Greg Newkirk's phone and an email going into his little icon. I definitely Who do think, you think that was from? I definitely think we're going to get to season two. Yeah. I think it was from David Christie. You think it's David Christie? I think it's David Christie. What do you think David Christie says in this email? I think he maybe explains his disappearance. I think that's possibly. I will say this. I will say this. And I had forgotten about this until we just brought this up. When I met him at Crypticon, Greg Newkirk, Yeah. I said, um, I asked him about this case and I said, uh, is there anything else that's happened? I know that the initial guy who reported it to you has disappeared. And Greg responded, oh no, that guy's long gone. I'd forgotten about that until you just brought that up. Huh. But I mean, that's been September. He could have emailed him back in the meantime. But I will say that that was September 2018. And a lot of this documentary yeah, was... takes place in September 2017. Yeah. So he said he's long gone. Long gone was Greg's words. The Greg, if you're listening, we'd love to talk to you about it. The hell was supposed to be? I don't know. I mean, I guess he just means he's foul face with the earth. Yeah, I assume that's what it was. So who do you think it's from? You think maybe Terry Rist? Maybe. Maybe David Christie. Maybe David Christie appeared back. Yeah. Maybe it's whoever David Christie, whoever was pretending to be David Christie. Yeah. But you know, here here's another thing that's gonna come up. Since this documentary's come out, everybody in their world are these crazy ass people is gonna be creating David Christie email accounts and emailing him. Sure, sure. And trying to fuck with him. And I guess that's a large part of why he didn't want to expose too much of the case before yeah. he launched the documentary. Yeah. Or before his team launched the documentary. Because his data would be tainted. Right. And I get that. I don't I wouldn't want that to happen either, but Yeah. And at first he thought, you know, he mentioned he thought it was like another 
researcher messing with him. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, do they do that to each other? Is it like, is it like a rivalry? Like, From what know? I understand, that's how he and Dana met. Well, they were just fucking with each other? Yeah, yeah. And that's how he, him and another researcher met, too. They were like, they would message each other back and forth and be like, this guy's full of shit. This oh, guy's yeah, full yeah. of shit. I so. remember talking about that. Yeah. That's just weird. I don't know. It's just, to me, the whole David Christie thing, the more I think on it, and we discussed it tonight, I'm thinking maybe it was a plant. And some of this stuff on the internet has been planted because they knew this was going to come out. Not saying Greg and Dana same. did that. Right. But, but think you think it's like a Richard Doty type situation. It's a Richard Doty type because it's almost like it's been built, some of that stuff. Why do you think? Do you have a theory why, or do you just um, think it's... <laughs> maybe just throw people off the trail of... Right, right. And, and what's actually on yeah, disinformation. Disinformation, because I mean, maybe this, but still, the whole thing about, you know, the footprint was, and another thing we didn't rank up is the footprint was awfully very similar to what was seen in Monroe County. Very much so. We yeah. didn't bring that up. Yeah. Yes, the footprint was very reminiscent of the Monroe County massacres yeah. and, and the footprints that were taken over there. I yeah. really forgot about that. So, I don't know. It's, it's definitely a rabbit hole if you continue to get your. But one night I just set up, you know, I set up pretty late, looking up this David Christie and, and going, you know, different things. And that's kind of what I found. But, you know, I even tried to find, like, email addresses. Right. And nothing. nothing. Because, like, mm. you know, if you go back on old forums, if David Christie, that, if that David Christie put that email anywhere, you could do a Google search for it, and it would come up if he, like, used it on some sort of form or message sure, or something. Because I can, like... Google like an old email address that I've used, and, and it pop out. up on forums and stuff I posted on years ago, like early two thousands. Is it possible he started the email address only to email them, and then I think that's possible, and then deactivated it. But there is something going on with this, Chris. I mean, there definitely is. And honestly, man, though, I I, I think that this David Collins is worth looking into. Yeah. This David Christie thing. I, I think so too. I think that's. That lines up pretty well, but again, like you said, it does all seem awfully convenient, and how many yeah. coincidences are too many? Right, right, and that's the point. It's convenient. Very convenient. Very yeah. Convenient. Hopefully we'll get a season two. Yeah. Um. Hopefully Greg, Dana, Connor, Carl, balls in your court. If you want to talk to us, we'd love to. I know we ain't no coast to coast, Yeah. and I know that's where you guys have been these days. <laughs> But we're right here in Kentucky, and we have a very deep interest in this, and I honestly feel like we have some information to share. So get with us for the rest of you guys. And, hey, for the Alien Cave Base Task Force, if if you're listening, check us out on Facebook. Check us out on Twitter. Check us out on our new YouTube channel. Hopefully what you're hearing us on now is on that new YouTube channel um, or, you know, on our website, as long as you're listening. Till the next moon rises, not owls. For Midnight in Kentucky, I'm Ben. I'm Steven. Thank you so much. Have a good night. You've been listening to Midnight in Kentucky, a Ransom Letter Publishing podcast. Join us on Twitter and Facebook, or get in contact with your questions, comments, or stories of high strangeness at midnightinkentuckypodcast at gmail.com.